Okay, welcome everyone to the None of Our Businesses podcast, our interview today via Zoom with Michael Houlihan and Bonnie Harvey. Michael and Bonnie are entrepreneurs who gave birth to the famous Barefoot Wine, one of the most popular wine brands around the world. They're also international speakers and best-selling authors. They started their wine business in a laundry room of a rented farmhouse. Currently, they consult and train startups and Fortune 500s on brand building and company culture. They're highly recommended by companies seeking to increase their sales and inspire their people. They're regular contributors to business journals. They contribute articles and interviews to major publications such as Inc., CEO Forum, and Forbes. Their latest audiobook is presented as a theatrical format with Hollywood actors playing the parts, original music score, and sound effects. The Barefoot Spirit. Well, welcome, uh, Michael and Bonnie. Um, I would like to jump right in, and we've got a a lot of questions here for us, and I want to make sure we get through them in in the time that we have allotted. So I'm going to start right away with your consulting business. Tell us about your consulting business, who you generally serve, and what kind of work you do with your clients. Well, we're delighted to be here, Ty. Thank you for having us. And we love working with young entrepreneurs, people who are starting off in business. If we can get to them before they've actually presented their product or their service, that's where we can make the most difference. So we can make sure they're on firm ground. Um, what kind of, uh, in the, uh, in my intro, I was talking about serving, uh, fortune 500s and small businesses. Are there, is there any client too small or too big? What's the, what's the general range that you work with? You know, the principles in business are the same, regardless of the size of business. We work for a company, uh, with uh, 4,000 employees and help them, uh, with brand building. Uh, and they were very successful. Um, we've worked with little companies who have products they're trying to put on the market. And no matter what you're doing, you have to get the word out and you have to get your product to your consumer. And in order to do that, yes, you might be able to sell directly, but in many cases you have to sell indirectly or you may have to go through middlemen or whatever. And so we have a tremendous amount of experience in that regard. And what everybody wants is not your product. They have other things in mind. <laughs> so you better know what they want because it isn't a great product at a great price. <laughs> so um, aside from your consulting business, you also, um, your current focus, as you describe it, use the acronym BAT. Can you elaborate on that acronym for me real quick? BAT. Well, that is, yes, Business Audio Theater. It's not just an audio book but it's really theatrically performed by experienced Hollywood actors and it has sound effects. It has an original music score. It helps to get the message out. Now we're founders of a very large and successful company and we want the people to understand what we went through, what our principles were, what our challenges were when we started off and how we accepted those challenges and how we were able to succeed uh, actually as a result of the challenges that we had. And people in any kind of business can learn from that. So we want to share the lessons that we learned that were very expensive, very time consuming and very stressful. We put them in story form. And that's what makes it business audio theater. It's like 3D for your ears. And we told our story in story form so other people could better understand the challenges we went through and use them in their own businesses. So we're offering that now to founders of businesses so they can keep their own principles and story alive. That's super exciting. And so, I mean, with these different things going on, what, I'm curious what kind of organization you have around you currently. Do you have employees? Do you have contractors? Do you have a combination of both? Well, what we've done with our wine company as well as this one is we have a lot of contracted services. So that way we can use the best people in their skills without having them on our payroll. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other thing I was going to add is uh, we really enjoy working with other uh, uh, entrepreneurs 
who are specialized in a specific aspect that we need. Like for instance, with Business Audio Theater, we're working with a group uh, down in Hollywood that is a uh, production company. It's an entertainment production company. They have actors, actresses, they, they have uh, sound effects, they have music, they have mixers, editors, they have the entire industry. That's not our world. Our, our world is really to identify the clients who need this and who can benefit by this and to uh, be able to convey the value of this particular type of communications technique, which is, hi, welcome to our company here. Listen to an audio book about us as founders and how we got our butts kicked in the real world. You know, maybe you'll identify, maybe you'll be more engaged, and maybe you'll be less likely to jump ship. So that's what we're really uh, focused on is really creating this kind of theatrical onboarding tool for companies to reduce turnover and increase engagement. Yes. Mm -hmm. I know company culture is an important theme in, in, in some of your work and the consulting that you do with companies. How does, how does that play out in an organization? I mean, a lot of um, good, smaller entrepreneurial organizations are similar to what you described. They work with a network of contractors and other entrepreneurs. How do you set culture and, and do that in, in that kind of format? Well, company culture, is, I think, isn't just the people that are employed in your company but it's everyone that touches your product or your service. So it's your entire distribution line, it's all of your suppliers, it's your buyers, and it's your end users. And in order to communicate uh, to each of those different groups effectively, then you have to understand what their needs are. And you do that by putting yourself in the other guy's shoes. Now that's good company culture. Find out what it is that they're feeling, what their needs are, and how you can give them what they want to do the job that you have to rely on them to do. I love that. I mean, that's, you know, a lot of times when, we're when I'm talking to other uh, business operators, they do look at company culture in a very narrow way in terms of their employees and their, their team that's like in their office. And particularly now in the current, we're, we're doing this right now during the, the coronavirus crisis and many of us are are in home working remotely and so um, I, I yeah I really appreciate your kind of expanded perspective and view on what company culture is there um, take us back to how you started barefoot wine what actually inspired you I know that was many many years ago what what inspired you at the time to start your own business uh, well it wasn't our love of wine it was our love of the wine uh, country which is where we live but it was an opportunity that we couldn't pass up. Right, Michael? Well, <laughs> a lot of people say, follow your passion. Yes. But we say, follow your opportunity, because that's going to happen more often. And follow it passionately. But don't give up on your passion. So we had an opportunity to settle a debt for Bonnie's client, who was a grape grower, who wasn't paid for his grapes for three years. And I had just met Bonnie, and she immediately said, uh, listen, I've got a collection for you, you know. Uh, this guy, uh, this, this, this winery owes uh, my client $300,000. Why don't you go see what you can do? So I went up there to talk to him, and when I showed up, they had declared bankruptcy that day. And the guard said, well, I hope you're not here to collect, you know, because you got to take a ticket and wait your turn. So we went through with the meeting anyway, and we were able to negotiate a trade. And the trade was, we'll cancel the debt for goods and services. And the goods were bulk wine. They hadn't been bottled. They were in big steel tanks, you know, thousands of gallons in each tank. And the other part of the trade was for services, which mm -hmm. was bottling services, which was taking the wine that was in those tanks and putting it in bottles. Now, no label. You know, no marketing program, no nothing. Instead no of get, sales. Instead of getting paid in money, you get paid in glass bottles of wine, all right? So now we thought, well. Oh, and we had to buy the glass. Yeah. And so, so you know, here we are. We're, we're like, as we say, we're an inch closer to the, the money, but we're not even a foot closer. You know, it's like this is 
really going to be tough, but we don't know it. So we say, well, you know, we have to come up with a label. We have to come up with a buyer. We have to understand the distribution system, come up with a marketing program. How hard can that be? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, and how long could it take? Right. We thought maybe three, four years. Yeah, that's It all. took 20. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, <laughs> it, that, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's a, a transact something that started as what seemed like a transaction turns into a business. That's amazing. A triathlon, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Triaction, that's good. A transaction to a triathlon. <laughs> so um, I have a clip here I want to I wanna play for our audience. And um, the clip is related. The question that I have that I want to play this clip for is um, how you came up with the famous footprint logo. Um, and so, yeah, let's, let's play that clip. She needed to make it solid. She needed Michael to draw it. And she needed this to happen fast. That's why she was almost vibrating to get it out and why she hustled a half-asleep Michael to the little green chalkboard in the kitchen. I know what the label looks like. This is going to be a big success. I could see it stacked in supermarkets. This is going to sell a lot of wine. Michael picked up the chalk and started to draw. Quick, quick, draw a foot. What kind of foot? A nice foot. Just draw it. Michael sketched a slim right foot along the bottom of the chalkboard. No, 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 stand it up. He erased it and drew one with the heel at the bottom and the toes straight up. Close. Tilt it to the right. He erased and drew again. No, no, more tilt. Just a little. Make it look like there's some motion. It's like someone is stepping up. Bonnie's voice was getting louder. She was talking faster, feeling like this was even more urgent. Her panic was growing. They could not lose this idea. Is that it? By now, the chalkboard had a layer of white dust from all the erased chalk. Really close. The foot should look like an exclamation point, an italicized exclamation point. And give it a little more arch. It got more tilt. It got more arch. How's that? Now write barefoot. Michael put down barefoot next to the angled drawing. Closer. Move it closer. Put the T all the way inside the arch. Bonnie stopped bouncing and looked at it. The board was nearly white. The air was filled with chalk dust. They stood silently, surrounded by their intensity. Both were taking big breaths. <sighs> Bonnie's fear had dissipated. They looked at a slim right foot, pointing up at a two o'clock angle, acting as an exclamation point for the barefoot written into the arch. They both thought it was good, but they had no idea that in not much more than a decade, it would become an iconic national label. <sighs> there. That's what the label looks like. That's going to sell a lot of wine. Okay, so we're back and um, uh, I'd love to hear your any additional thoughts or comments on on that clip and, and on that uh, on that topic of how you came up with the logo. Well, we went out and asked a lot of questions besides the fact that it suddenly came to me in the whole picture of what the logo looked like. Uh, it came from the answers that we received from a number of people. Again, putting yourself in the other guy's shoes, we wanted to find out what was important to different people that touched our product. So Michael had gone out and he talked to a top wine buyer here in California, and we got a lot of great information from him, like make the name the same as the logo, for instance, which we did. And we also asked questions from the bottling line manager, what should the label look like? And he showed us labels that had been bottled over the past 20 years on that bottling line. And the ones that did uh, very well, they'd been bottled over and over again. They had a nice clean picture. You could see the image and it just kind of jumped right off the bottle and you could easily recognize what was going on. The ones that didn't do so well had a lot of curly cues in the script and maybe they were dark or they had images that couldn't be seen from four feet away. So that was all incorporated into this, this label that suddenly I, I knew what it looked like. <laughs> and the other thing I'd like to add to what Bonnie said is, did you notice how this was performed for you and not just read to you? Um, so that's what business audio theater really is. Uh, you become immersed in the story because you, this is 3D audio. The, the, the movie is taking place in your brain. 
And so, you know, you always see those old pictures of the family in the living room, uh, you know, focused on the radio. And you say, well, why are they focused on the radio? You know, on the speaker, there's no screen there. What are they looking at? Well, they're looking at the motion picture in their brain that is coming in through their ears and they're participating in the story. So uh, that's what's really neat about that clip Mm -hmm. is it not just tells you the content of what Bonnie's talking about, how the foot came into being, but the way it's being presented to you is also revolutionary. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, um, I I think that's an exciting, exciting way to teach having been a, uh, an instructor at, on the faculty at Portland State University in accounting for over a decade, always looking for, I was always looking for exciting ways to teach what otherwise could be a fairly stale topic for a lot of people, particularly the general business majors that maybe just had to take an accounting class. So, so I definitely appreciate the, uh, the theatrical elements in uh, delivering material like this. That's, that, that's wonderful. I think, um, I want to play another clip, which gets at a different a different theme that you guys have in your consulting and in your writing, uh, which is about brand building and specifically how you went about building the Barefoot Wine brand. Michael Houlihan drove to the far end of the Piggly Wiggly parking lot in Columbia, South Carolina. That's what he did in every parking lot, and it's what all good salespeople do. Park as far away as they can. The spots by the door are for customers. Store managers noticed the courtesy. It was mid-May. The sky loomed thick and close, a dark, steely, greenish gray. Michael didn't so much see the clouds as feel them, hot, heavy, and steamy. It was the kind of day that discourages movement. Ah, spring in the American South. Michael is a tall man, six foot two, a bit gangly, with reddish hair and an air that says he spent some time on a surfboard. He was wearing a dark suit, carrying barefoot wine samples in a bag over his shoulder, and holding a large foam core sign with a five-foot-tall purple foot. This was not a guy they saw every day at the Piggly Wiggly. When Michael had driven up, a dark-haired teenager was collecting stray shopping carts and wheeling them back to the store. By the time Michael started lugging his wine and sign across the 30-yard lot, The kid had abandoned his carts and was sprinting for the supermarket door. Hey, buddy, you better run. Say what? Run. Michael looked left and right. All he saw were parked cars. Did he hear the kid right? Then, boom. The thunderclap almost knocked him over. Michael felt it in his spine. Whoa, what was that? He stood there shaking it off. Maybe five seconds later, it began to rain. Not gentle, soothing, wimpy spring rain like he knew in Northern California. This was rain from a fire hose or a falling river. Buckets and buckets in seconds. Drops that fell like walnuts. (sighs) Got it. In seconds, his suit was soaked. His tie was soaked. His shoes and socks and pockets filled with water. He started running for the store. Then came the wind, huge, uneven blasts blowing hard from the left, then hard from the right. Michael's sign turned into a sail. It yanked him west halfway across the parking lot. Then it pulled him east. Then another gust pulled him west again. He was hanging on, figuring if he let go, the sign would land in Georgia. Left, right, lurch, wobble, just don't let go. Inside the store, people had stopped. No one was checking out or bagging groceries or moving. They were watching this tall, fair-haired, California-looking guy in a suit, getting hammered by rain and staggering back and forth, wrestling with a giant purple foot. He disappeared out of view for a moment, then reappeared and heaved off in the other direction. He was barely making progress towards the door. The whole show took maybe four minutes. Michael tottered into the store through the automatic doors and just stood there for a second, catching his breath. He was leaking water onto the floor like a broken barrel. He looked up. The whole store, the shoppers, the clerks, the bag boys, the kid who'd been pushing carts stared at him wide-eyed. No one moved, just people staring. Michael stared back, dazed and dripping. That was the only sound, the dripping. No cash registers, no rustling, no chatter, just drip, drip, drip. Above them, out of the ceiling, 
that supermarket mechanical voice broke in. Wet mop, up front. A few seconds later, the store manager, a tall man with a southern gentleman's manner, walked up to Michael. Son, I know you have something to sell me, and I know you want to sell it real bad. Yes, sir, I do. Okay, so yeah, I mean, exciting to hear how you were building the brand. Tell us more, uh, if you want to elaborate on this clip for us, that would be wonderful. Well, once again, uh, before we get into the content of the clip, you notice how you could actually hear the thunderclap. You could hear the rain. Uh, you can, you know, you can hear the southern accent. Uh, you, you can hear the cash registers and the noise of the supermarket. So you're right there. Uh, you can hear the guy pushing the carts around with that, you know, clanky, tinny sound that they make, uh, you know, the, in the parking lot when the, when the, uh, when the shopping carts are collected. Uh, but, but in the scene, what you notice is that the proponent, which is the character that plays Michael Houlihan, is doing what he has to do to sell the wine. Yes, he's the president and CEO of the company. Big deal. He has to <laughs> get out there with his five foot sign, weather the wind and the storm and the rain and get it in there and make a presentation to a store because you know his distributor isn't gonna do it. Nobody else is gonna do it. He doesn't have a ton of money to hire a bunch of people. So he's out there doing it himself. And where is he doing? He lives in he lives in San Francisco, but he's making this sale in Columbia, South Carolina, for God's sake, on the other side of the continent. And so, this the real message uh, in this clip is: you do what you got to do. Yes. So many people go into business today; they have preconceived ideas about the business, about what the job will be like, and what the work will be like. And then they get into it and they go, you know, I didn't sign up for that. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> you still got to do it. <laughs> no, I think that's, um, th that's a great uh, transition into my next question about pivoting and, and making changes to your strategy over time. Because you started, you started small, you know, very small, and then grew a large business. And, and we can imagine in, in most cases when that happens, you have strategies and then you have to kind of shift or change those strategies over time. And I think you were just speaking to that to some extent, doing what you have to do. But I, I'd like to maybe hear more for our audience about, about that, about uh, your strategies and, and how you may have ch had to change strategies over time to ultimately grow the business. Well, one of the things that we love to do, one of the things that we love to do is, is to put the lessons in story form. So if I could tell you a short story that's also in the book, in the audio book, as well as the paperback, is as we're growing our business, we're looking for what's called low-hanging fruit. So where is our product going to sell the fastest? Okay, and we thought, how about Hawaii? People are always walking on the beach, so it's like free advertising with the bare footprints on the beach. So Michael made a trip that direction. He went to Hawaii. He rode with the salespeople of this distributor that we had there, and he sold in every account. Oh, they were so happy to have that lovely wine and a great price. And uh, he came back, and he was pretty excited, and we'd shipped a truckload of wine over there to fill all the orders, but we didn't get any reorders. So he said, I guess I'd better go back and see what's going on. So he went back and visited all the accounts. Well, the product had sold through. The, the retailers were delighted. They said, oh, yeah, we sold it right through, as if that was the end of the story, right? Well, why didn't you put it back on the shelf? Oh, it was new. I guess I forgot. He looks at the salesperson from the distributorship, and, you know, like he didn't care whether it was on the shelf or not. He was selling something else that month. So he put the something else on the shelf where our product had been. Well, he resold and restocked all those stores and came back and said, I think I've got that. But no, it had happened again. So as he's preparing to go back to Hawaii and leaving me to juggle payables and receivables, I said, you know, I don't think so. Look at this report. This is how much it cost for you to go to Hawaii. And this is what we're making. The big lesson there was that in order for us to expand to territories outside of where we could 
physically drive to and from right here where we live in Northern California, we had to have somebody on our team. And it's what we called our wine cop. We had to have a salesperson in every territory to work with the distributor, the retailer, to work with the end user and to work in the communities where those people came from to support what it was that they were concerned about. So again, we had to put ourselves in everyone's shoes, but we couldn't do it unless we had somebody on the ground in those territories where we grew our product. We had to get a great reputation wherever our product was released. And we had to do that by really policing the situation with distributors, retailers, end users in the community. Yeah, a lot of people get involved in this sell, 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 but they don't realize it's really service, service, service. Yes, it is. You know, because everything you've sold needs to be serviced sooner or later, whether that service is to get a reorder or to take back a spoil or to make sure the price is right or to make sure it's well positioned in the store or if it's programmed or if it's on ad or whatever. Uh, I would say one of the big wake up calls that we faced was, oh my God, look at all this work we have to do that we didn't plan on. I or, thought somebody else was going to do or, that. Or we'd get, a, we'd get a little bit ahead, you know, like, hey, look at this, we're $50,000 ahead. You know, what do you want to do? You want to buy something like a new car or something? <laughs> no, we need to have uh, a rep up in Oregon. And, you know, he needs $50,000 base salary before he's working on his commission. And before you know it, we realize that every dime that we're making has to go into growth. Yes. See, because there's only two directions in that stream out there. You can go upstream or you can get washed out to sea. You can't tread water. So it's a very interesting wake-up call once you get into business and find out what you really have to do. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I love that's a profound, uh, important statement that everything you sell has to be serviced. I think that's yes. such a such an imp such an important lesson, and also you know the part of your story. It's been my experience in consulting with various clients that are starting up uh, consumer goods companies that, um, yeah, you can't expect the distributors and the retailers to uh, merchandise your product appropriately or, or uh, That's right. make sure that the reorders happen. Um, even if your product is doing really well, it is often the case. They'll just check that box and move on to something else. And so you, you, you've got to police it, as you said. And, yes. and I think that's yeah. Yeah, an important lesson. It's a lesson popularly for held misconception. There's a lot of popularly held misconceptions out there when it comes to business. And I think we've been victim to most of them. I think we'd, <laughs> we've acted on most of them. <laughs> yeah, so... So yes, we, we talk a lot about those types of, of misconceptions in our book and in our audio book. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Michael and Bonnie, and we will see everyone next time. Thank you. All right, actually, on the topic of automation, I thought this is one of those newpreneur.com, you know, clickbait articles, but I thought it'd be a good bunch of point for some discussion. So opportunities for automating whilst launching a business. So it's kind of like the five things I think you should be uh, automating when starting a business. So one thing, one, ironically, uh, juxtaposition of the How Not to Develop Your Practice article, social media and content marketing uh, is one of those tasks that people tend to move to the bottom of the to-do list. And so they say, if you automate it, it'll be much easier to do that. And you can even purchase content if, that, if you so want. Uh, invoicing is one that they say you should automate. Reporting is one that they say you should automate. And I feel like Ty will have a, probably a, a thing to say about that. And expense tracking, uh, you should automate with the easy to access expense apps that they have out there that we have an experience working with. So I thought I'd get your guys' take if there's something they left off the, the list that should be there, or maybe something that's on the list that they're way off the mark on. For or trying to suggest that you should automate it. Well, it's it's right it's right on point of what we talked about earlier, the content marketing side, right? The, I mean, this is part of what I think Rosenberg was getting out of just throwing out, if you're a CPA firm, for example, but I think it would apply in any industry, just throwing out a lot of uninteresting content or, or yeah, yeah, it's hard to imagine how 
without the human touch, if you're just automating that process, you're not, uh, there's not a, there's not a human behind it. It's not a personal opinion. It's not a personal expression of what they believe or what they think or of their knowledge or anything like that. If you over automate your content and marketing process, um, you know, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it would work at least not in a professional service environment. Maybe, maybe if you're automating for a large brand that isn't, that isn't intended to be, people aren't as personal, but it, my, my guess is, is that large brands are actually paying what they're paying for the resources to have it be more personal. And it's the smaller businesses that are always trying to kind of do this on, do this on the cheap by just like putting something in an automation machine. And don't get me wrong, we automate social media to, we automate some of our posting processes using popular programs to do that. But, but like, we're actively engaged in determining what those posts are and what goes into it. There's not, there's not some random automation that just pulls an article from a third party and throws it into the queue for us. We, we develop the content and, um, and decide what we're going to say and who we're going to tag and all of that in, in each of the postings that we put out. Yeah, I've always thought automation was kind of more, you know, I didn't think it was a good candidate for something like social media. I mean, it makes sense to automate the posting activity and whatnot. But if you, like you said, if you try to automate too many things out of that process, then it completely loses the thought that made it interesting. Um, I, I, in my career, I've, it's been focused a lot on automation because I've worked with a lot of companies that either make software to help automate things or just people who are very interested in that topic. And so I'm kind of of the mindset that if there's anything that you can automate, I think it's a really good practice to get in the habit of doing that. Um, the article comes up with a couple of good topics that I think are good candidates for it and that businesses should consider automating. Um, I want to kind of give a different take, which is to share maybe a more general approach to like, how do you think about whether or not a, a task is there for automation or is a good candidate for automation. And so there's kind of this popular um, web series called XKCD, which is like a uh, comic and it talks about a lot of different like programming concepts. And so I wanted to share this chart, which is basically a decision making chart used to try to like illustrate how do we look at a process and think about whether or not it makes sense to automate? And so on the one side, you have how much time you're going to save by doing it. And on the other side, you have how often you do the task. And between these two, you kind of look at it and decide, okay, well, these are the things that I think are even candidates to automate. And then when you get into actually automating them, I mean, there's a lot of different tools that you can use that I think are helpful to get in the habit of using and so there's this book called Automate the Boring Stuff with Python, which is basically just geared at how do we take steps out of our day? How do we look at things that we might not have thought were good candidates for automation and realize that actually these can be you know, done more efficiently because there's such a wide spectrum of what can be automated. So um, I know that like in my career, um, Excel and VBA and AutoHotKey and all these other softwares have been great for automating. Um, but I work at a company that, you know, automates uh, Amazon repricing services. So some of the things are on the more complicated side. But I think it's, it's always been amazing to me to just think about how many different things are done in the world that could be automated in some better way or would just enable um, people to focus in on what they do well. Um, AJ, you had mentioned about how, I think you brought up a really good point when you said that Ty would maybe not be a fan of automating the reporting cycle. And I think if you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think why you said that was because of the fact that like, without someone there to kind of interpret the results and think about what that report's trying to say, it kind of loses all of its meaning. So it's a good place for, it, it's a good candidate for over automation. And so, yeah, I think that, you, you know, it just takes a matter of looking at each thing and deciding whether or not it's something that you're contributing value that a computer otherwise couldn't. Um, and reporting is a good example of one that, you know, the person still plays a key role. Um, but yeah, I just want to share those resources. I thought they were interesting. Yeah, that's 100% and kind of building off that, that point on the reporting cycle. I would be all for automating the actual getting the reports. I think it's the the interpretation and the the um, kind of thinking through what it means strategically is the part that that I don't I don't foresee you can easily automate and 
Um, but I think, you know, in terms of automating the reporting cycle, I think we're like right on the verge of it. I mean, I think there's different folks who swear it can be totally done. And um, I still am on the fence with saying, I, I don't see that it can be done entirely across the board for every company because the problem being that the, the inputs are not standardized across small businesses. So in the small business world, automating the accounting and reporting cycle is still very difficult. And I'm sure as I say this, there's some wizard out there who's done it in their company who's going to kind of post a comment and say, I've done it. Mine is 100% automated. And we close our books in 24 hours after month end through our highly automated process. And anyone could do this kind of thing. But, um, but, I, but I would beg to argue that point with the fact that the most popular commercial small business softwares still don't do that. So, you know, if you've, if, if you've done it, you've done something that that uh, the rest of the commercial world hasn't quite figured out how to do. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> if you can do it, great. <laughs> so what is my, is what I have to say about that. I think, I think maybe the more interesting question is what, what can't you automate away? I think it's probably the, I'll use an example. I worked at a call center and the call center work was um, a roadside assistance. So think like a triple A. If you broke down, you call for a tow truck, you would rent, you would reach like a central call center and they had a database of contracted tow trucks and they would come out, you would schedule a tow truck on a preferred rate because they're supposed to be getting a lot of calls as your roadside assistance for all these different companies. And uh, I don't think you could automate that process because you have people that have been involved in an accident and often you would have to have them call 911 because here they are with a broken leg or something on the side of the road calling roadside assistance. And I don't necessarily know you can program empathy or, you know, the own wherewithal to pick up your own cell phone and look up the, you know, what the 911 dispatch is in Lexington, Kentucky, if somebody really needed the help. I don't know if a computer program could do that. And I think, you know, bringing it back to accounting, I don't necessarily know that, you know, talking about standardized uh, inputs, everything's so different. In, in, in a, I guess the inputs are so different. So you can be working with different currencies. You know, somebody delivers a bill that's in a different currency. Does the you know automation process then figure out what the exchange rate is and put in an estimate and pay the bill immediately? You know, or if you have to make conversions on your inventory from you know packages to pounds or from you know cases to gross to individual products. You know, the way that the information comes in, I think. You're looking at a lot of different variables that are up in the air and you might be able to take pieces of it and automate it but i still think especially with the interpreting results side but also some of those inputs you, i don't necessarily know you could automate it unless you took a, an extraordinary amount of time and an extraordinary amount of effort to automate the output of somebody else's data i guess is the best way to put it so this, is, this is getting super nerdy but to, to what you're talking about you know when i when i say that that dynamic and variable inputs are are still a problem. Um, I don't mean that I believe it'll always be a problem. I just mean they still are a problem currently. And I think the examples that you gave with the roadside assistance and everything, those are actually just different forms of the variable input dynamic uh, scenario problems. And so I think, you know, getting nerdy on it, what to appreciate is that there's a difference between the topic of automation and the topic of artificial intelligence. And so automation is something that we've been doing for a long time. And without AI, the path to automation is standardized inputs. But AI, that is, that is the big problem that AI is going to solve for us, or at least that's what we believe it's going to solve for us, is that AI has the ability to learn and do what human being brains are able to do in terms of learn and take in all the variable and dynamic inputs that there can be. And and I think that the, it, it's shocking, it would be shocking and scary to most people if you were to kind of talk to like the leading or kind of read about some of the leading AI research in terms of what it actually is able to do already and what they believe it will be able to do. So I would not, I, I would not stake a bet against the ability to handle some of the scenarios that you talked about. I, I just, all I would say about it is the hump that you have to overcome is AI. You have to have actual AI to do to do some of that stuff and we don't have it yet. We think a lot of times we think we do, but what we really have is more rudimentary automation. We don't really have AI. 
yeah, yeah. And I wanted to be clear that I was talking about the automation portion, you know, and not the, not the AI portion. And yeah, good highlight though. Yes. Yeah. And I saw just an interesting AI post on LinkedIn recently that was talking about how it's really interesting how we've done all these machine learning uh, approaches and everything recently, but that this whole pandemic has changed all the inputs so much that anything that has been learned in the weeks before it was basically irrelevant. And so even when you try to implement these types of, um, you know, solutions as the whole setup and as the situation changes, it, you know, doesn't know how to deal with that. And so, yeah, I think there's never any full substitution for, um, you know, a person's personal interaction on an issue. Um, yeah. What do you got next for us, Charlie? So I've got another article um, from Variety. It's called Amazon stock hits all time high amid surge in orders and company is worth 1.1 trillion. And so on the one hand, this article is talking about how because of this whole kind of coronavirus pandemic and well, and because of it was already, you know, Amazon was already doing really well before this, of course, but this has just completely um, accelerated that. And so it's given some kind of key stats how the company's worth over 1.1 trillion, Jeff Bezos is worth over 137 billion, and all these crazy metrics to say how great things are going. But then at the same time, we have all of these sort of controversial issues going on where there were protests. Um, they've been known to, for example, fire people who have been publicly against their policies. And so I guess I wanted to kind of get your guys' feel on whether or not you feel that these type of controversial things are gonna happen at any company at this scale or whether or not this is indicative of issues in Amazon's overall leadership structure. Um, yeah, I just wanna get your guys' take on that. I might say that Charlie, you love the Amazon articles. <laughs> That's very true. I am guilty of that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Every week we get an Amazon article out of Charlie, so I'm always looking at which Amazon article he's going to pull. But I will say, um, you know, I think we talked about this earlier. I don't know whether or not it made it on film or not, but uh, we were talking about how. Uh, with scaling and how management of people scales. And I think, you know, if you have a team of 10 to 20 people, you can scale like good, good culture and good management skills. When you're talking about, you know, the vast number of employees that Amazon hires, and you're talking about especially warehouse workers and stuff like that, how we talked about how kind of you need to account for where their whereabouts in, in a given day. I think, um, you know, the management style is different there and I don't necessarily know you can carry on like a cool, relaxed kind of company culture when you have a billion employees or, you know, however many worldwide workers Amazon has, eventually the means of oversight will leave, you know, the central hands that had a cool hip work environment to begin with and it very much is just any other job, I guess, you know, a fulfillment job. So I imagine, you know, the, the company culture coming into play there um, at that point. I mean, it, it, at this point, Amazon is what Walmart was in the 90s and two, early 2000s as far as like being a very, low, you know, the low price leader, very commoditized on everything and employees kind of being, you know, a, a commodity in the cog that is the machine. So I think you know, you're probably seeing that. And, you know, it doesn't surprise me that people that are taking a stand on, on you know, unfair work conditions or not having protective gear during this time and they're still working. Um, it doesn't surprise me. I wish it wasn't the case, but I don't necessarily know. I mean, the alternative, I guess, for such a large machine, I guess, and such a large training cogs everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I think a different way to say that is, from is that when companies get really large, they become like a stand-in or a proxy for uh, for corporate America at large, right? It's like the issues that people have are issues they would have with a lot of companies, but you know, Amazon becomes the poster child of those issues, right? And you mentioned Walmart; it was the same kind of thing with Walmart. Is that that some of those issues were some of the, some of the issues that came up with Walmart were indicative of corporate America prob 
problems in corporate America, society at large, but the, the largest kind of player in that game becomes the becomes the uh, the focal point of that discussion. And I think that that in part is just the size of Amazon makes that in part part of what's happening there. Um, I, I think the other side of it, though, that's interesting to think about is how does a really large company like an Amazon actually cr create or maintain culture positive or negative across the entire company? Uh, that's that that's a pretty amazing feat in either direction, actually. <laughs> you know, if if in fact, I mean, I don't I don't want to pretend to know what the culture is at Amazon. I haven't worked there. I've, I've had colleagues that have worked there, but if in fact there is. Uh, a particular uh, cultural stereotype at Amazon that is pervasive throughout the entire company, that, that, is, that alone is kind of an interesting point given the size of it, because you would think with that kind of size that it would be like any other large organizations that it would really just depend on what part of the organization you were in or what, you know, even what part of the country. When I worked for a big four international accounting firm, uh, I, I couldn't ascribe a culture to the entire firm uh, worldwide. Uh, it was known to me, at least, that the culture that we had in, say, where I was in Portland, Oregon, in that office was going to be dramatically different and was different than the culture of the same firm's office in New York or in the Bay Area or other places. And so, yeah, just the idea that, that Amazon could have a pervasive culture across the entire company is, is an interesting point as well. I mean, it means you, if it's a positive culture, it means they're doing something uh, any positive aspects that are pervasive means they're doing something really amazing. Any negative aspects means, wow, there's something really wrong if they're able to sustain such a negative issue across the entire company. Yeah, I think the protests they've been having are probably indicative that there's a pretty good healthy mix of uh, people there who don't agree with all of their practices and, and that there's dissension in the ranks, uh, so to speak. And so, yeah, I think, yeah, anytime you get to that size, you just have, you're, you're not going to have everybody be on the same page. Like you said, there is no way to, to have that culture be that pervasive, you know? So, yeah. Right. Speaking of culture, I have another, I have my, for our last article this week, I found one, and this actually came up in a kind of a different way. It came up through a tweet that there's a game streamer I follow, and he was actually reacting to this tweet with uh, dollar sign eyes. And basically, the the um, it's a Wall Street Journal and the CMO Today section, but live sports and entertainment events are shut, and so sponsorships are taking a hit. And so the tagline is kind of a six-month shutdown would put $10 billion in sponsorships in limbo, one term says. So they interviewed a sports and entertainment uh, industry kind of lawyer, I guess. And basically what he's saying is the lockdown is creating troubles for brands that already spent or committed to spend sponsorships this year and it might have, and and that they may not be made whole. And so there this is basically unprecedented ground and the global marketing director of IEG, which is a, a part of the Bruin Sports Capital, said that there's simply no standard contractual solution to address all this and that some sponsors will have a clean op exit options and may be entitled to refunds, while other contracts may not clearly stipulate what happens when something like this happens. And it goes on and it says basically some of, the, some of this money has been uh, funneled into like virtual events, game streaming, uh, what they call non-traditional sports or e-sports or something like that, uh, and live concerts because they address kind of the live aspect of like Coachella and stuff. Um, and then other ones, other, um, marketing partners are doing the regular marketing speak and saying they're sticking with their brands some of this may not be a big deal because a lot of like the NCAA or NBA kind of television rights and stuff like that are multi-year contracts so if they lose out on one year they still have another four or five to make up for the sponsorship dollars or to engage more in those years but I thought it was interesting from uh, dollars and cents at how much money was on the line for these sponsorships and I guess kind of as it, and wanted to know from you guys if this would maybe be an accelerator to a more kind of online digital marketing, I guess, or digital sports kind of craze. And I wanted to get your guys' take on that. Well, it's, it's, not, it's definitely not a world that I've followed, um, but from listening to, listening to you discuss it, I think it's, I mean, it's always precarious if you are just collecting 
uh, fees from customers or clients or from sponsors and you're not able to provide value for those fees you're collecting and if your position is well you're legally obligated to pay me so I'm just going to collect from you I mean that you got to imagine that really trashes relationships when you do stuff like that but I guess it, it also depends on the relative market power of the <laughs> of the organizations that are doing it right they may they may get away with it if they got they get their organizations with a lot of attention and when the economy and the world opens back up everyone's going to want to buy into them again they might uh they might get away with it right it might you know some sponsors may just have to look at it as that's kind of their cost to stay at the front of the line so to speak with uh with an organization or with a if it's a sports event or uh some kind of other event thing with a with an event that has a lot of attention to it that you want to be connected with paying these sponsorships during a period that you're not feeling the value uh, may just be what it costs to keep you at the front of the line is what I'm thinking. Well, and I think it's like one of those really interesting things because it's like pushes the boundary. There's like that um, con typical contract clause called force majeure, which is like designed to handle extreme events and, you know, like earthquakes and tornadoes and acts of God and that sort of a thing. And it's, um, you know, but wasn't written maybe with this type of pandemic in mind and maybe not all of these contracts had this sort of thing, you know, well thought out. And so I guess it's just kind of an interesting point of, you know, the cost benefit of like how you analyze a contract would require you to really think about the likelihood of these types of events and what that contract um, recommends that you do in that case. Um, one of the kind of interesting things that I had seen personally on this topic was that, um, you know, AJ and I watch UFC and one of the things that they've done is they tried to buy, a, not, I don't want to say buy, maybe it was just renting, but they tried to host an event on an island essentially to try to get away from all of these laws designed to stop them from having these events. But um, Disney, who ultimately owns the UFC, basically put a stop to it. And so it's interesting to watch as all these sports try to, you know, find new ways to exist in this new time. Um, but they're not figuring it out because, yeah, it's not, it's, there's not an alternative right now for them. That's a different angle on it, right? Because what happens if this, if the current conditions last long enough and there's viable enough alternatives that really capture the public's attention, right? There's a limited, you know, we don't think about this, but there is a limited supply of attention out there. Every individual person only has 24 hours in the day. They presumably have to work some of those hours. And so, you know, there's only so much attention out there. And so if, if this lasts long enough that, that new and innovative uh, events and things maybe digitally capture people's attention, some of the, some of the things that have been doing well in the past may, may never come back at the same level that they were before because the attention's already moved on to something else. Um, that might be a real fear for, uh, for situ companies like that that are just like shut down with not doing anything for, uh, for a period of time. Well, I think, it, and, and you don't underestimate how much that these digital mediums are already taking off. I mean, I'm looking at the front page of Twitch right now, which streams video games. So you're actually watching somebody playing competitive video games. Well, not even competitive. You're watching them play video games. And you probably have, right now, live count 2 million people in just that one platform, eyes on. That's what they're watching. And I don't think that's an unusually high number, I mean, uh, compared to, like, off times. And if, going to Charlie's point, if the UFC would have aired that uh, fight on an island, it would have been probably the most viewed sporting event Ever because there's no other sporting events right now and so I think it was a genius marketing move to try and make it pay off but I think to your point Ty I think we've probably already made the move to being you know to like sports being uh, yeah they would be popular but I think we've almost turned a corner to where online entertainment and online probably uh, competitive you know viewing is probably you know on the rise and we may see some traditional sports go the way boxing and horse racing did back in the 20s 30s 40s boxing uh horse racing and baseball were the three most popular sports in america now i mean you're struggling you know i would i would you know if somebody the listener and can put in a baseball player on the minnesota twins you know baseball team i'll, I'll, I'll send them ten dollar gift card card that's starbucks but i don't think you know and no googling you just have to type it in <laughs> 
but I don't think you know that that those sports uh, hold the same hold the same kind of uh, appeal they once did, and I think we're seeing an acceleration to the other side of what will be popular here in five to ten years. Totally, yeah. I mean, this may be another one of those things that the pandemic uh, accelerates uh, an already existing curve because before this, I mean, esports was starting to gain traction. It was didn't didn't we follow Gary Vee? I think he invested in esports or got involved in some way. Um, and this was before this whole thing, right? And so yeah, yeah, he's involved in a you know. Sorry, I mean, I, I get excited when I'm talking about, <laughs> but he invested in a Call of Duty league, actually. And so it's one sport; it's an esport. But he uh, is an investor for um, the Minnesota Shot. Ah, I, I can't believe it. oh the Rockers. That's the name of the the esports thing. But there's uh, in that league, I think there's ten or twelve teams that are local teams that compete. Um, and they and they were trying to move the league more to like a live sporting event that's also simulcasted. But I think you're going to see the shift where it'll just all be online from here on out. I think you'll see that shift. Yeah. So this may be. I mean, this may be an accelerating event. I mean, they may have shaved years off kind of the the buildup of of their audience because of this event. It definitely seems that way, doesn't it? Well, I might mention that, that we're speaking from an American point of view. In South Korea, you're talking about, like, there used to be three television stations dedicated to StarCraft, a, a strategy online game, you know? So, and they would have huge, mega, you know, uh, arenas watching people play this game. Uh, and, I mean, League of Legends is huge. So if you're talking worldwide, I would say it's, the, the, it's probably overtaken traditional sports by by a mile if you're talking about viewership wise for these digital sports. Well we only care about the US of course. <laughs> just, just kidding to our <laughs> any international viewers we're just we're just joking. We just, we just lost the international viewers. <laughs> well, we so now we're, we cut our viewers in half, we're down to five. Yeah. But I mean <laughs> we could definitely say the US StarCraft was not the the top watched uh, sporting event no. <laughs> in the in the U.S. market. Yeah, no, yeah. definitely not. <laughs> All right, well, I think did we get through all the articles? I think so. I think we did. Who wants to call us out? Oh, well, before we exit. Yeah, before uh, we get out of here, we, we, have, have, a, we have a song to sing. Birthday in the house, yo. Yeah. <laughs> to Eden's birthday is what next week. Yeah, I think it is. Ethan, tell me if I'm wrong, but isn't your birthday coming up here, right? So in uh, three, two, one, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy coronavirus birthday. Dear Ethan, happy birthday to you. <laughs> you got the you got the very first one and only none of our businesses uh, sing along for your birthday. We have to apologize for our voices to the viewers. I mean, I can only speak for myself when I I know it's hideous. So yeah, that Zoom quality is questionable, huh? <laughs> It's questionable altogether. Yeah. I was a great singer before we got on this call. Uh, <laughs> Ethan, Ethan is our is our uh, producer and and does a lot of background work for us uh, at TCA. So we very much appreciate him and hope he has a happy birthday, even though he is also stuck at home and can't go out with anyone. All right. On that note, thanks for dropping by and listening to the podcast this week. If you'd be so nice, hit that subscribe button, the bell down below. To subscribe, tell your friends about it. Do your internet karma some good and hit the like button. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone.